All right, everyone. Good morning. Glad to see everyone here. Um, today we're continuing our study in the book of Mark. Uh, we're in chapter 10 this week. Uh, we've got 52 verses to cover. Um, so I'm going to try to talk as fast as Tim and get it all in, but I don't know how I'll do. Um, I get sidetracked. But um, we've got 52 verses to cover, but before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word, to see how it applies to us today. Lord, help us to use it, to learn from it, Lord, and just lean on it every day of the week. All these things we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, so Mark chapter 10. Um, as I've mentioned before, Mark, it's a book of action. Um, it's just there's never a stopping moment. It's like it's breakneck speed, and you can almost imagine if you were one of the disciples, some of us would be out of breath because it's just a nonstop pace. And you got to remember, they didn't have cars. They weren't taking a taxi to the next town. They were hoofing it on foot. And they were just nonstop traveling. And most of the time, they were camping. They were sleeping in tents. They were just on the go. And they didn't have all the creature comforts we have. And, and now we think if we go camping, we've got to have, you know, we call, we, we call it glamping now, right? We got to have glamour when we go camping, but these guys were roughing it. So, um, verse uh, number one in chapter ten. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn there with me. Um, it says Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea, across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. So that's the one common thread with Jesus. Whenever he found himself surrounded by crowds, he saw that as an opportunity. And he's like, I've got a captive audience. And he begins to teach. Um, so he takes advantage of that. Uh, verse 2, some Pharisees, surprise, surprise, wink, wink, uh, they came and tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And they loved to throw these questions out, didn't they? And you know they spent all night the night before thinking of what they were going to ask him. They probably put questions in a hat and passed it around and said, okay, pick one. What are we going to ask him and try to trick him with? <clears throat> so, and Jesus always responds with a question, um, which is what I find fascinating. And he kind of throws it right back in their lap. So he asks them in verse 3, he says, what did Moses command you to do? He replied, they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But I wanted to go back and look at the original text when Moses was talking to the people and explaining these laws to the people and when it first happened because Jesus here is quoting uh, they're quoting from the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 24 and verse 1. It says, If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. And it had gotten to the point in Jesus' day where... It originally began with infidelity to where in Jesus' day, if she burnt the biscuits that morning for breakfast, he could divorce her. And that's what it had gotten to. And they had taken that and just twisted it and added their own little spin to everything. And by the time it got to Jesus' day, it was insane, the reasons they were divorcing people. And so... But Jesus tells them, he says, it's because your hearts were hard that this was even permitted in the first place. Verse 6, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united 
to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. How many of you have ever been to a wedding and heard that quoted? Yeah. Um, so Jesus is trying to flip the tables on them and say, look, when you get married, this is what it's supposed to be. This is the outline. Um, there should be no thing in here where if she burns the bacon and burns the toast that you get to divorce your wife. Um, but let's go back to the original text. Um, all the way back in the beginning, the book of Genesis, um, chapter 1, verse 27. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And in chapter 2, verse 24, it says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Also in chapter 5 of Genesis, verses 1 and 2, it says, this is the written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them, and he named them mankind when they were created. So Jesus is not telling them something that they didn't already know. They had just twisted it by this time to mean what they wanted. And how many people today take one passage of scripture and they twist it to their own use? Do we see that in the world today? Where people can just pick one little piece out and say, this is what I believe, you know? Or they take stuff out and say, I don't wanna see that part. But we've got to keep the whole word together. And Jesus is just telling them the exact same thing that was already there. And they knew it, but they didn't want to hear it. So he doesn't stop there. He says, verse 10, when they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. So as was often times it's mentioned where Jesus would be teaching the crowd. And his disciples are listening as well. They're just as in tune to listening to him as everybody else. But then they would have the opportunity to get him to himself and say, please tell us more about this. We, we, we're missing just a, a little bit of something. Can you further expand on this? Can you please explain it more to us? So they had the advantage that no one else did because they got to sit down with him after. And then he would go through his notes, basically. And they would ask questions. And he would explain it to them further. And he says, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. Isn't that interesting? How many of us think that way today? But that's what Jesus said. Now, if you divorce your wife and you marry another woman, another woman commits adultery against her. Isn't that crazy? But that's what Jesus said. He said that, and if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. So once there's been this union, and he tells us in the beginning that we become one flesh, um, and there's actually been scientific studies on what that actually means. But there is actually a transfer of epithelial cells when two people come together. And that those cells actually stay with that person. Um, and they become one. And so skin cells, whatever it may be, I don't want to get too graphic, but we all know where I'm going. But there is a transfer of cells. And they become one with each other. Um, so when another woman goes and marries another man, she still has part of that other man with her. 
um, and so on and so on and so on. Um, and Jesus is saying, this is how it happens. Um, and I'm sure that they had more discussions after that, but they didn't write them all down. Um, so it moves on there to uh, now Jesus is sitting down, he's done teaching, and now people are kind of busting through the crowd, if you will, to get to him closer, and they're bringing their children with them. And they're bringing babies, infants, little children, toddlers, and they're begging to let them sit on his lap, um, that he would put, their hand, put his hands on them and bless them. And can you imagine how many of us would stop at nothing if we had the opportunity to have our child sit in the lap of Jesus? Look at what people go through to let their child sit in Santa's lap, who is an imaginary figure. Can you imagine Jesus being there and you having the opportunity to let your child sit in his lap and he bless them and put his hands on them? Well, that's what they were doing. It says people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He was angry when he saw his disciples trying to keep the children from him. And he said to them, let the children come. He's like, don't stop them. Send them on in. And he says, let them come to me. Don't hinder them. He says, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And we could talk about this all day long. But the best way that I've come to understand this verse and explain it is that a little child, and Ruth can tell you from her years of teaching small children, that they are so open and so willing to learn, and they're so accepting of what you tell them. And just, I mean, if you told them that Jesus was going to be here at 2 o'clock, they would be here waiting to see Jesus. But yet, if you tell that to an adult, they're going to be like, they're crazy. But a child has that pure belief. They have yet to become older and wiser, if you will. I'll use that lightly. But they don't have the chance yet to become jaded by the world. They haven't experienced um, hatred yet and racism and all of these other things that we can pile on to us as we get older and all of these other things society wants to use to define us. And they just have this natural innate ability to believe and to give love and to want to be loved and to learn. And Jesus is saying, look, if you guys could just accept it like they can, I wouldn't have to talk to you anymore. Because they are just so willing to accept it and ready to believe. He says, if you cannot receive the kingdom of God like a little child, you will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. And it doesn't say he did it to just some of them. It says he did it to all of them. And I don't know how long it took. It probably took hours all night long. But he didn't turn any of them away. Um, then, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. He cried out, good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a good question, isn't it? Isn't that something that all of us should be asking when we first meet him? What do we have to do? It's a straightforward question. And look what Jesus tells him. He says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good. Doesn't that strike, strike you as a surprise? How many people in the world today think they are good? If you, if you did a survey, you'd probably come back with 99.9% .9 of the people ask, believing they are good. But what does Jesus say here? He says, no one is good. That includes you. That includes me. 
and everyone else throughout history and still to come. We're not good. Um, he says, only God alone is good. He says, you know the commandments. So he's telling this guy who asked him, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus is just saying, look, I know you know these things, but I'm going to go through a little quick refresher with you. He says, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother, yada, 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 is basically what Jesus is saying. And he's like, you know all these things. These are just common knowledge. You already know what these commandments are. So the guy replies, he says, teacher, all of these things I have kept since I was a boy. And I find that sentence hard to believe, but I'm sure there are people out there who have kept these. But once again, if we were to survey everyone in this room and ask everyone if they've ever told a lie, and any of you reply with no, guess what? <laughs> you just lied. Um, and so all of us have broken these. And he says, look, I've kept all of these since I was a boy. Jesus looked on him, and he looked on him with love. He wasn't doing it to be spiteful or anything. He loved this guy. So he says, but there's one thing that you still lack. One thing's missing. And the guy's probably like, give it to me. What, what is it? I want to know the answer. And Jesus said, go, sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and join us. Follow me. Stay with us. And it says, at this, the man's face fell. His jaw dropped at that answer. And it says he went away sad, and it tells us why. Because he had great wealth. And he was a young man, it tells us. So he probably, this was generational wealth. He probably inherited this wealth from his family. He's never known poverty. This is a wealthy man. And Jesus says, yes, you've kept all of these commandments. He didn't dispute that with him. He says, but there's one thing you lack. He said, I want you to sell everything you got and come and follow me. What if he were to tell any of you in here today to do that? Give it all to me. Give it away. And then just put all your trust in me. How many of us would act the same way as this guy? Would our jaw drop? Would we be sad? Probably. Because unfortunately, we've come to rely on money, right? We need money to get by. It's a cause and effect. We have to have it to exist, right? We have to have food. We have to have clothing, shelter, all of these things. But the one thing that Jesus was using this, he was using it as a teaching point, and he goes on to explain it. But he wanted his disciples and those around to see this. He wanted it to be an example. And he used this young man as an example. He, you know, this man went away. He just turned and left because he was sad because he had all these possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, and he's talking to his disciples, he says, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And that was amazing for them to hear. Um, because in that day, and even in today's society, we put people with wealth on a pedestal, don't we sometimes? And we tend to think higher of them than we do somebody who's poor. It shouldn't be that way. But that's the way the human mind works and the human heart. We begin to think that money gives you prestige. It gives you a place in society. But it doesn't. Um, he sees right through it. So his disciples, it says they were even more amazed now. They felt they were amazed in the beginning. 
Now they're just flabbergasted. They're like, are you kidding me? And he says, they said to one another, and they're looking at each other and saying, well, who, who, who can get into heaven then? How is it possible? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. So, yes, can you have money and get into heaven? Yes. Jesus didn't say that. He said it's hard for them to get into heaven. Um, so Peter speaks up and says, as Peter always does, first to speak, slow to listen. <laughs> um, he says, but Lord, he says, we've left everything to follow you, Lord. Man, I left my boat. I left my nets. I was still paying on that boat. And I was fishing. And I had an income. I left all of that to follow you, Jesus. Um, and that was Peter's response. That it was a natural human response, right? We would think the same thing. And, but Jesus says, truly, I tell you. He says, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields. And he should have said, and boats, Peter. Um, for me and the gospel, they will not fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions. Ooh, persecutions. That doesn't sound good, Jesus, but that's part of it. He says, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Um, so what is he getting at here? Um, he is explaining to them um, how important it is to realize that we need to give him everything. And we're not supposed to look for a return on our investment. That's up to him. We're supposed to entrust that to him. You know, when you make an investment at a bank or with whatever institution, you know, they tell you the terms of the investment, but then once you make that investment, your hands are out of it, aren't you? You're not in there doing anything with the money. You're trusting them to handle that money and then give the return back to you. It's the same thing with Jesus. We're supposed to be investing ourselves in him and the gospel and entrusting him to do with it what he wants and then entrust him to give the return we're not supposed to be worried about the return that's his job um, we're supposed to be doing the work um, so he says many who are first will be last um, and then like I said, Mark is just a book of action. He is going from one thing to the next. And if I were the disciples, I would have a hard time digesting all of it and comprehending it all. And just, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. I'd be thinking about what he just said. And can you imagine them whispering to each other at night? What do you think about what Jesus said? Well, what do you think? And I'm sure that went on constantly. And they're having a hard time keeping up. And in typical Jesus style, in verse 32, they're moving on again. Sorry. Um, it says they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. Um, and the disciples were astonished um, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the disciples, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. So now he's starting to get more bold about explaining to his disciples exactly what's coming down the pipeline. And he's getting them ready. And as I said, they were having trouble keeping up with what he was giving them. Now they're really going to have trouble keeping up with what he's giving them. He says plainly, verse 33, we are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles 
who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, kill him, and three days later he will rise. Man, that's a lot to digest in two sentences. <laughs> Can you imagine their reaction? It probably just slapped them right in the face. And they're thinking, huh? What, Jesus? I thought we were, we had this mission. I thought we were going to spread the gospel. I thought we were coming into Jerusalem to teach and preach and, and, and what? And it had to take them aback. Um, they had to be speechless, um, which is hard for Peter. Um, then, verse 35, it tells us that then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And if you know your Gospels, you'll know that they took this moment on the bequest of their mother. Um, their mother had requested that they ask Jesus about this. And the film series or TV series, The Chosen, uh, we just finished watching those in the theater last week. And they actually covered this topic. And they did a great job with it. Wow. And it showed them thinking about talking to Jesus and who's going to ask him first. And Mama wants us to ask him. And, and then they did it. So it tells us here, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want to do for you, he asked. And they replied, let one of us sit on your right and the other on your left in glory. And Jesus replied, you don't know what you're asking. He didn't tell him no at this point, but he said, you don't really understand the gravity of what you've just asked for. Um, and the closest we can come to that is if we go back to the book of Job um, for a reference, Job chapter 38, verse 2. And you remember, if you remember anything about Job, um, the last couple of chapters are when God is speaking and finally revealing his process to Job. And up until this point, it had been accusations against God, questioning God, why God, how come God's doing this, God, and why would you do this to me, God? And finally, when God gets his turn to speak, one of the first things he says to Job is, who is this man that obscures my plans with words without knowledge. Job, you're a bag of hot air. <laughs> and you don't understand what you're talking about. And then God goes on to explain to him what's really going on behind the scenes. And that, Job, I've got a bigger plan than just you. And there's more going on in this world than just you. And so... Jesus is saying the same thing to James and John. He says, you guys don't really understand the gravity of what you've just asked for because you don't understand the bigger picture. Remember, Jesus was both God and man. And he knew what was coming. He knew the humanity of it, but he also knew the gravity of the uh, spiritual side. And Jesus asked them, he says, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. And to put that into modern terms, can you handle what I'm about to go through? If we were to trade places, James and John, can you handle what's going to happen to me? What if they do it to you, James and John? In order to grant the request that you've asked for, you've got to go through what I'm going through. You're going to be beat. You're going to be tortured. And he's like, are you sure this is what you want? And he's like, if you're man enough, are you man enough? And that's what he said to them. And he's, they answer unequivocally. They said, we can. You know, and they're not thinking. <laughs> they're just thinking about being with Jesus. And they're not thinking the big picture through. But... Jesus replied to him. He says, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. Now, 
we know through historical records that all of the disciples were martyred in one way or the other for their faith, except for John. And this is the John we're talking about, so James and John. James was one of the first to be killed. He was actually run through with a sword in the street. He was one of the very first to be killed for his faith. John, we know, lived until old age, but he had been tortured many, many times and miraculously survived it. He was boiled in a pot of oil. Can you imagine? He was put in a boiling hot cauldron of oil and boiled alive, and miraculously God saved him from that. He was beaten. He was tortured. He was thrown in prison many, many times. He was tarred. All of these things happened to him. He was exiled on the island of Patmos, which is where he wrote the book of Revelation while he was there. And it was not just exile. It was actually a mine. It was a prison mine on that island. And they were captive, but yet they were prisoners working in the mine, toiling day and night. So it wasn't a vacation island for him. He was in prison there. Um, so, yes, Jesus said, you will drink the cup that I'm going to drink. And he says, you are going to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. He says, but to sit at my right or my left hand, that's not for me to decide, guys. He says, these places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And can you just imagine, let your mind wander for a minute, who is going to be sitting at his right and his left? We can't even begin to imagine. If it's not James or John, then who is it? It just says that they've been prepared for someone, and it's not them. He says, that's not for me to decide, guys. And it says, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant they became angry with James and John. They were like, how dare you ask him this? You know, I was going to ask him that. That's why they were mad. Um, they wanted to be sitting on the right and the left. Um, but then Jesus knew what was going on. He called them all together. He said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them but it's not that way with you guys he says not so with you instead whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be the first must be the slave of all for even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many um, and if we look at <clears throat> the book of john um, the greatest example of that is when Jesus decided to wash his disciples' feet. And he did it as a ceremony, but also to give them an example. Because how many of you know, and Ruth knows from being a teacher, that different people learn different ways, right? Some people are visual learners. Some people are practical learners. Some people have to have it written down for them. I'm a visual learner. If I see it, that's the way I learn. And apparently that's the way the disciples were too because Jesus did this so that he could show them physically and visually what he wants done. So in John chapter 13, verses 12 through 17, it says, When he had finished washing the disciples' feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I just did? So he's just point blank asking them, do you know why I did this, guys? Why did I just wash your feet? He says, um, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than one who sent him. Now that you know these things, 
You will be blessed if you will do them. So he led by example. He wanted them to know that, yeah, he says, you guys have given me a title, and that's right. That's who I am. He says, but I want you to understand why I did this. I did it so that you'll understand that none of you are greater than the other. So he was continuing this lesson that began with James and John asking to sit on his right and left. He's like, none of you guys deserve that spot. None of you are better than the other. You're all equal. And we can apply that here, can't we? None of us in this room are better or above the other one. We're all the same. We should all be serving together. It doesn't matter how we're serving, where we're serving, what we're doing. All of us are equals. And we should be serving each other as well as serving God. Um, so that's what he was trying to teach his disciples, um, to convey to them that, you know, it's not all about you. Um, it's about what we're doing and how I want you to act with each other. Um, then we're getting there. We're almost done. Um, blind Bartimaeus, they encounter him, and again, they're on the move. <clears throat> um, and what I love about the different Gospels is when they record them, especially with Mark, he writes it in such a way that it looks like they have not even stopped to eat. They haven't stopped to rest. They didn't, it doesn't tell us they stayed for the night. It just tells them they were going. Um, so again, verse 46, they came to Jericho. And if they came to Jericho, that means they had to, what, go. They went. They had to be on the move. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him, bring him over here. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet, he's calling for you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus replied. And Jesus already knew, but why is he doing this? So everybody standing around has an example so that they know what's happening. Um, he says, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you immediately. He received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. And I couldn't help but think of the contrast here between the encounter with this man and the rich man we saw earlier in the chapter. What did the rich man do when Jesus said, sell your goods and come and follow me? He hung his head, turned around and went the other way. Here's this man who was a beggar. He was homeless poor. I'm sure he didn't smell good. He didn't have on the best clothes. And he's begging on the side of the road. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do? He says, I want to see. And immediately he gives him his sight. And does the man say, oh, hold on, I got to go home and take care of some stuff. Let me go sell my possessions. This man had no possessions. He had nothing. And what did he do? It says immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. He just immediately followed Jesus. What did he have to lose? Nothing. What did he just gain? His sight. He had been blind all of his life. And if you had been blind all of your life, can you imagine you might want to say, oh, I'd love to see this. Or I've heard about this. I've heard people describe this. I want to go try out my eyesight and see this. But we don't see that with this guy. He just follows Jesus. And can you imagine the first thing that this man saw was Jesus' face? 
What about the blind person today who's never healed? <coughs> Guess what? If they believe in Jesus Christ, the first thing they're going to see is Jesus' face. Just like this man. The first thing they're ever going to see is his face. Um, so this homeless man, this beggar on the side of the street, he was given his sight. And the first thing he saw was Jesus. And he did not even question. He just immediately started following him. Um, and the Chosen series, I keep mentioning that. If you guys have not seen it, I encourage you to. It is free to watch online. Uh, you can stream it on your phone, your television, whatever. But they do a great job with a lot of these scenes. And they show the encounter with this blind man. And it's just amazing. And they show these people joining them and following them and working with them. And it's just amazing to see and put a visual with what's happening on the page. Um, because we forget that these are real people. These people live this. This isn't just a story that somebody made up. These were real people, real situations, real interactions, and flesh and blood, and they lived it. And their story's recorded for us uh, through the grace of God. And it's just amazing to see what they can do with television and movies and putting this on the screen and being able to visualize it and see it. And it just becomes more real than it already is because we know it's real, but we forget sometimes when we read it on black and white text. And after a while, it just becomes black and white text. And we forget that it's connected to real people and real situations. So let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for it enduring for so long. And Lord, as you promised, your word will never fade away. You said the earth and everything around will fade away, but your word will never fade away. Lord, we thank you for that promise. Lord, help us to apply the word to our lives. Help us to... Learn from what you taught your disciples, what you taught the crowds, everything that happened in your day-to-day -day life. Lord, help us to apply it to ours. And Lord, it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Welcome.